All right, welcome to the podcast, Hass Discusses. I'm the host, Michael Hassapin, here to discuss filmmaking, content that he creates, distributor, many other amazing topics, hardcore music, and including that. This is Lauren Lepre, and um, let's go right into it. So what's your experiences with a distributor? Okay, so I've been in the film industry since 2010. And you end up, I just started as a simple actor. And little by little, I started, for, you know, transitioning into What's directing. that theater company you're a part of? Theater company, why, that's where I trained to be an actor. That was Walnut Street Theater. Nice. That's where I trained. I was in Philadelphia, which is the oldest acting school in the entire country. So that, that's definitely pretty cool. And uh, little by little, I just started uh, shooting short films, getting, you know, experience and that is always say short films is where you make your errors before you go make a feature film and little by little i built my team i i, I built my uh my whole resume and i started getting trust in the people of like yo this guy gets the things done and I finally i got some money together including my own pocket <laughs> and uh then I finally got the dark military after five years uh, with the trilogy that I that I'm putting together. So the first one is done, which you can find uh, watch right now for free on Tubi and Amazon and Movieplex and Tubi's and, dope. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank I you found much. um, you know that movie King of New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's on there. And like I did a I did a little video analysis of that movie after finding it on Tubi. And like uh -huh. that's my highest viewed video. It's got like six point four k views or five. I, I don't. I don't know. Good for you, man. I know it, it all helps. You know, Tubi's the best outlet right now. Like Tubi, Tubi got bought by Fox about I think six months ago. So if you go into Tubi now, you could see all. You could watch any of Fox News across the entire country. But they're gonna start original content too because like Peacock is NBC, Tubi is Fox. So what's Pluto? I'm not sure, but Pluto, uh, you got Pluto. Point is, everybody's getting their own streaming outlet because that's that's the new norm. But so we're right I, now we're right now talking about the free ones that everybody watches because, like, if you have like the Plutos or the whatever, why do you need to pay sixty a month or whoever the fuck you know what I'm saying for like I, Comcast? You're right, and one of the things that's cool about Tubi and all that's like you don't have to pay for that. It's free. So what? There is commercials. That sucks for a second, but there's no nudity cut out. There's no violence. You know, the language is all there. And it, it's kind of cool when you watch your own movie and you see a commercial. You're like, wow, this is, <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, the commercial in my second movie. And if people complain, like, about commercials in, in like, Tubi, you're probably watching YouTube as we speak. You, I mean, you are watching YouTube as we speak, and there was an ad to get to this video. So, yep. viewers, if you're in your head thinking... You're too lazy to go to Tubi. Reevaluate your situation, but continue yeah. on distributor. Yeah, yeah, and but for but yeah, Tubi will eventually, I think, will be just like Amazon and Netflix, where at the beginning they took your film because they needed content. They didn't care what it was. Now Amazon and Netflix is the hardest thing to get on because they 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 want the best quality. Once you start original programming, it's all over, you know. So that's where Tubi came. So I think Tubi eventually that'll happen there. They'll start making original content, Pluto TV, all that, and then there'll be a new Tubi somewhere. You know, it just it just shuffles down the line. So as long as there's someone, uh, there's networks like that, you're always we'll always have a place to go. But when it came down to the distributor, guys, I mean it's a real ugly business out there. It really is. There's no, there's not a lot of friends in film. You were, you know, I was reading up nightmare stories, especially for someone like everybody knows, like Lions Gate. You used a clip from um some other video that I actually watched a year ago from some other guy complaining about his experiences, and he made this beautiful. I think it was some film about special needs. It was a great. You know what I'm talking about? You edited a film in your little distributor video. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. There was a few of them. Yeah, there, there was. I, I took because one of the things about that the distributor video was like. I wasn't going to just, hey, we're live. Let me tell you a little bit about distributor. I always found people that ran. If you're an audience member, yeah, the person's upset. Who are you believing? You know, sometimes. So I, I kind of came up with like, 
I'm not going to, I'm just going to tell a story. I'm going to narrate and I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you the clips of my journey and actually show what these people did with the news articles of the LA times, like show proof of what they did. And the audience member could, you know, take what they wanted out of it. So I made a short film out of that, you know? So, but the film industry, which was, was cool about distributor up until they would did what they did after 10 years was you could get to, you can't get to Netflix. You can't get to any network. You cannot call and be like, Hey, I'm a filmmaker. Can I get my, no, that does not work. You have to have a film agent. You got to have, that's basically what the stripper was. They were a film agent that had an avenue to get you to all those outlets. However, um, when you sign with something, somebody I just spoke a second ago about Lionsgate, what the nightmare that was happening with any of those distribution companies, particularly Lionsgate and all that, like you'd get on there and you'd be like, oh, cool. My film's on Lionsgate. Look at that logo. Like, hi, uh, you know, hi, I'm walking on the street. My film's at Lionsgate. Great. Problem with Lionsgate and all these distribution companies is they don't pay you. Okay. They find ways not to pay you, period. Because they know a Joe Schmo like me, like, yeah, I'm a filmmaker, guys, but I work five days a week. I'm up, I'm up every day at six in the morning to go work. And they pry on that, meaning they know you don't have the, the lawyer money to lawyer up and go after these people. They're going to find a way. Same thing with the music industry. They know you. Okay. I would like to say something about music industry, though, is that it's if you want to get on all platforms, you can get on all platforms. Can you get to the front page where they're recommending shit to people and the big playlists? No, yeah. you can't. And mm -hmm. you're easily – like if you pay for DistroKid, which is like 20 bucks a year, you can easily get on all platforms. You get you get 100% of your royalties, right? But – are you your search results are easily nobody's gonna be able to find you if they search your name you're barely able gonna unless you have a lot of streams yourself does that make sense it makes sense i mean the music industry and the film industry are the same and how they get screwed it's just which way is it gonna happen like in film like a lion gate will be like at the end of the quarter when you're supposed to get paid it's not like ah f you they send you papers they'll send you an email and be like we spent 50k in marketing your film and you're like where like show me <laughs> where it's at like can i see it in a magazine like what, what, what were you running the trailer before a youtube ad like show me and they're just like no it's like because you didn't do that that's why you know and then you're like well i want to see something show me and they're like we suggest you have a lawyer contact us they they, they almost taunt you like that you know so what was happening is everyone was not getting money. And that's where, uh, at the time, distributor uh, debuted. And what happened was, got reversed. They could get you on any platform, but you had to pay them money, which at the time, I think was $1,600 an outlet. So $1,600 to Netflix, uh, $1,600 to Showtime. So what, just when you're done, paying all these bills you're now paying it's like a band hi i want to play with the foo fighters you know okay well you better go sell 300 tickets you know you almost like have to like pay to play so that wasn't a, a, a the, the greatest thing but they were paying you and what was happening was you could set it like 7.99 a download or 3.99 you know rental people were being paid for years but you got to realize okay, you're going to pay that for each outlet. And if a new outlet came along that you want to get on, you get on it, but you got to pay for it. But you got to do that balance. Like, okay, I'm 1600 in a hole over here just because of that. Like, you know, are you going to get enough rental fees per quarter to make up for that. And then keep in mind, distributor was a place that host your movie for you and got you in. You have to do all the advertising so that is where I started, like, my movies are basically targeted for the horror movie audience. So I'm crawling Scream Magazine and the, buying the, the cons, like the horror cons. Like, I love yeah, the horror cons. And, like, you got to go meet your fans at the horror cons. So you're renting a table. You're paying three fifty for the table. Okay. Um, I got, you you want to give out some free stuff. You also want to have some merch that are cool. Like, hopefully, you know, you can maybe break even with the table. But, oh, wait a minute. I'm in Philadelphia area. I'm in Atlanta. Well, I got I got to get two nights of a hotel. 
that's more money it plus gas and the feed yourself you're another thousand dollars in a hole and what's happening is people are taking the cards like your movie well they're gonna go uh you know watch your movie well distributors making the money i'm thinking i'm getting back in the court at the end of the quarter basically it was just like you it was a big sucker job in the end and it was a complete nightmare because it, I, I literally just did my first uh, driving cross country. It's just something I've always wanted to do. I've done it four times since then, but um, you know, I was like, okay, you know, I, I, I'm going to time this around the time that quarter ends. So when I come home from my cross country, I'm going to have money waiting for me. <laughs> and, and I got back and they, you have the date. It tells you the date you're going to get paid. And I look up and it's like, no, you know, nothing. And when you, anytime you would call a distributor or email them, they were pretty quick with getting back to you. And this was the first time I contacted them where it was like nothing. And I had a bad feeling. I'm like, there's got to be something up. So all the other filmmakers, there was thousands of films, man. I mean, thousands of filmmakers. Oh, we all started talking to each other. Like, yo, did you get paid? Like, yo, are they talking to you? No, no, no. And then it finally leaked that they filed chapter 13 and some of the filmmakers because they're based in california went right to their door and uh all the blinds are down the signs off the door the four people that what well, mainly run that thing that some of them went and got jobs elsewhere just like that then they took the profits of all of us us, our, us filmmakers and hired uh glass and ratner i think is what was the proper name the, uh, a lawyer company with our money to liquidate everything. So basically you can't even talk to the distributor. Now you got to talk to them. So we got screwed. The monies are going to a lawyer that we're basically paying with our money to keep us out. And the worst part of that whole thing was, I mean, man, depending with the listener right now, be like, okay, well losing money is the worst thing to me. But maybe when you hear this, you might have, you might even think it's worse. This, this, and I thought this part was worse was, when your film is done and uh i'm sorry let me reward this when the your film is uh is locked into these uh, these networks like netflix through distributor you can't call netflix and say that's my film take it down only the the, 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 that company distributor the aggregators what they're called can take your film down so basically picture your film can't be taken down uh, you can to, to, to then get your film back and you own it again and then reshop it to a new district, you know, new company to get it back up that you can actually start getting money. It's basically quarantine and frozen. And since distributor co- uh, filed chapter 11, like at Amazon and iTunes and all, all the other outlets, it basically got shadowed to darkness and said, this isn't uh, available to rent anymore. So, but your film's up there. But you need it down to restart the whole process over. Distributor did not take our films down. They went and just started a new job because they had to support themselves. And they left thousands of us contacting all these outlets. And it was a nightmare to get these down. Distributor did not get my films down. I got my films down of countless emails and calling. And I'm telling you, there was times you were talking to somebody and like, we're going to switch you over to someone else. And then boom, you're off. Like they, they, they either purposely hung up on you or, you know, accidentally got disconnected. You got to start it over. You're talking to someone on email. You're talking to some guy named Kevin. And all of a sudden, hi, I'm Frank. Can I help you? I'm talking to Kevin. Well, what's your problem? And it starts the whole process over. And you, it was, it was insane. So yeah, distributor. It was, it was insane. Think, think about that guys. You, you, I call it, I always said, look at it like this. Picture you bought a property that has 10 units. You're now a landlord. Everybody loves your property. You get 10 clients that move in. And at the end of the month, those renters say, we're not paying you. And then the bank says at the end of the month, well, that's no excuse. We want our money. That's basically what happened to all of us filmmakers. So as those bills kept coming in for uh, for me and anybody else that bought marketing, those credit card bills, those bank statements, you're still in a ditch taking grenades. And it was one of the most like insane things that's ever happened to me. And I'm just so glad like IndieWire, the LA Times, uh, Variety, they jumped out. Alex Ferrari, he went ham and 
<laughs> but he ruined him. You know, I love Alex Ferrari. Like he's a Alex is great. He's really been like leading the way. Like he, he was really the, the guy I found out like like his official post of like what happened, and then he yeah. made a group. And I think that the guys from the distributor, I think those guys thought we were just gonna cry for a week and go away. We didn't. And this is why, like, I made that video. This is why I, I, you know, Susan, when you said you wanted to talk about this, I, was, I jumped right on. Like, yeah, I'm never gonna let those guys forget. Uh, clearly, yeah, two out of the four have jobs in the film industry, so it didn't. <laughs> they only went so far. But I will. I'm not one of them people. I really don't like the gripe about the past, but like. Man, that was that was that was four years of but my that's, life. But that's and the and even I assume like even making the movie itself was probably it was probably it seemed like it was a fluid process based on the way you've continuously described it in your videos and all the you know the interviews and stuff that's out there. It seemed like it was fun, but like I got a question though. What's more, what's more difficult, pre production or post production? I'm asking that very generally. Yeah. Uh... Pre-production will always will always be harder because you got all your chips in place, but until you actually film the movie, some of them chips can move. You could have a location, you could have a camera person working for this price, like you could have lights you're renting from this price, and it could all change. A cast member could, pardon me, could drop on you, you know. So to yeah. me, once the movie's done, then you can kind of exhale, but you are sitting there forever going through footage before you could even start editing. And then, you know, editing's never nice. Cause then, you know, you, you, you might have audio pockets and you know, you got, you got, you got problems. I mean, nothing about this is easy. But if it was like that saying, if it was easy, everybody would do it. But, uh, you know, yeah. for me, the fact that like I had 70 actors that I basically said, We've been in a countless movies. Philly's not known for like good films coming out as far as in, independent wise. We see a lot of films where you film it, it and it just never sees the light of day. The director either just decided not to edit it, scrap it, quits the industry. So as an actor, you're like, damn, what can I, what can I give my time to? I know. And actually that's actually going to come out. The benefit of me the actor to try to get my ass to like Hollywood permanently. So I told all these actors like hop on with me. I I I will I will be the guy. I go I will get us a finished product. I promise. And you know you you'll be able to see it at all times. And like when the distributor thing happened, like I said, th those films were left up there, but like they were, like I said, they were like shadowed. Like if this is available, this movie's not available to rent. So any of my cast members are like, oh, I'm in this movie, The Dark Military. Let's put it on. Not available. It's like, I felt, even though I didn't do it, like I'm letting them down. I mean, that was like so humiliating to me for that time being of like, you know. At least you're oh, able to get here, it here's back another up film on something that, though. You know yeah, what I mean? Everything you said that wasn't going to happen, the worst thing happened, you know? And, so yeah, that was a that was a real rough time for me with that. I mean, oh yeah, and I describe like um the independent because I've analyzed this a lot. I've read the whole Robert Rodriguez. I went through the I didn't necessarily go through a filmmaker phase. Like I still kind of want to do that, and I've still made unreleased films and stuff like that. But like I realized that shit's really different than like the early '90s, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? And I've compared two things. I've compared independent filmmaking from the 90s i said that it's the equivalent of uh the rap industry five years ago because really all these soundcloud kids blowing up with all their independently produced stuff does that make sense to you and how like the the independent industry sort of changed and it's really one out of a thou thousand becomes like it's like you don't get a lot of safety brothers is what i'm saying that yeah uh they're both of them are always changing uh, music and film like anyone can make music now on their computer you know what i mean you comb your feet yeah exactly and i'm not that i'm that that's not a, a a slander in any way and also i could say like you could shoot a movie on a, on your freaking iphone if i do not advise that you, know, you better have the proper lighting and audio but you could get away with that i mean uh, it, it's crazy filming got easier to do and the films are coming out so much better but the payment in the end 
is not worth like the juice ain't worth the squeeze. I almost I tell everybody like the truth is the dark part of the film industry is like if you're gonna make a film, it's almost like a vanity film. It's just it's just for your mantle. It's just like I made this. Don't expect like if it was the '90s, every film got bought, no matter how horrible it was. Yeah, Mr. I, we- Mr. Weinstein would pull up with a check. Yep. <laughs> like when you really look at it, like uh, it's a great movie. We all know it, and it's all influenced us in every way. We all love the Kevin Smith universe, but like, <clears throat> look, look, look at what Clark's was. This is a bunch of people hanging out at a freaking, you know, like he got a check for that. Bunch of people just hanging out at, you know, at, at a quick stop. Yeah, <clears throat> you like, could never get that money for that today. It would, they, they, they may put it out, but they, they're not giving you a dime. All the distrib- I had about 40 some distribution companies come after the dark military because I was constantly marketing it, why it was being edited, and every one of them sending me papers. We'd love to have your film, blah, blah, blah. And all the paperwork had zero dollars on it. And every time I brought it up, like, you going to buy this for anything? We're like, oh, no, no, we don't buy films. Oh, but you're going to put mine out because you love it so much. And then, and, and it's like crazy because a lot of these film companies, all they want to do is get about a thousand films and then try to like content uh like get, get in with comcast and pluto tv and all that and be like look at our section we got a thousand films for me if you take it they're just trying to buy bulk they're not really there to push your film the way you'd want it and it, it, it it's really dark like that because you're hoping you get some money back out of this you, you but in the 90s you did the yeah. 90s i mean i'm telling you the, the that, that was like the, the last straw before everything started changing because downloading happened. The same thing with the, the music industry. Like once the Napster stuff hit, it, it, man, it, 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 you remember like even like the Tower Records and Sam Goody. I mean, Sam Goody was charging $18.99 a freaking CD at one point. I was like, wow, that's insane. And it pro- cost them 37 cents to press. Like it was, the money was his hand over fist back then. You know, so it, and stuff it, like it, Chud was being made. <laughs> I love that movie though, but but the Chud Part Two, yeah, dude. I um, think they're both free on Tubi as well. Yeah, I f- and um, they used. To, I love the Joe Bob Briggs analysis. That is a class. I love Joe Bob Briggs or however you say his name. And you said it right. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I gotta get back on my Shutter stuff because I used to subscribe to him and I don't, I don't sub them anymore. But but. Yeah, man, it's crazy seeing stuff change, but I would say there is a sort of pressure, sort of in the way that you were had to advertise everything yourself. There's a yeah. pressure now to be your own distributor, and like there, everybody wants to take the leap of faith and just put it on either a YouTube or build like a fan base. You know what I'm saying? How would you say you've learned from that, and what do you think you're gonna do with your next film? Are you gonna self distribute it or put it online for free? Or well, when when you're with distributor like the idea of that, that was putting it out yourself. So then you do that and you set up the merchandise store, you know, at, at the, the dark military logo was like a very sellable thing. So it'd been like pillows and shower curtains and glasses. And it, it you know, uh, you can still, the Blu-ray is available at like a, a bunch of different outlets, like screen team release and average superstar films and then die box. Like the horror movie fans know where to go. It's, fr- it's on Amazon and everything. But like, all I did was go to Film Hub. Film Hub is the same thing as distributor, except they actually pay you. So you are still, I am still, even though I'm with Film Hub, I have to advertise my film. So people go to the outlets that Film Hub got me on. So I get a quarterly check. And I have been. I film I have to admit Film Hub Film Hub's been good. So but how did like, you find out about them? There was only two at the time. There was Distributor and there was Film Hub. And the only reason I didn't use Film Hub is because Distributor was allowed around longer. And that was like the one. It was spicy. Two, distributor was way up here. And Film Hub was like, yeah, it's coming up, but you got to trust Distributor. They're, they're the main one. I figured you go with the Nike, you know? Like, what, what could possibly go wrong? And, <laughs> and I, I got great. in there and, yeah, that's what went wrong. So I had to, you know, get the film back off of all those outlets and then, you know, then, then start it all over. I mean, submitting a film it, it, to one of those things, like like a distributor or a film hub, it's the same way you would up, upload a YouTube video. Like, well, that sounds easy, but it's not. Because it's QA checks. And there's this, 
okay, we need artwork now. We need this. It's got to be these. It, it's not It's not as easy as you think. It, it, it's not something you're going to be done with in like a day or two. Like it, it, it's, a, it's a while. And I'm not a guy that's like big in Photoshop. So I don't like go back to one of my producers and unsung hero, Steve Carino, like, Okay, they need them out. They need posters at all these dimensions and stuff. It's like it's crazy, and then you have to crush the file down a little bit, or maybe up. You know, it, it's crazy. And the pixels, and big, the size it, of the pixel of the poster. Oh my the- god! And then you know, then you have you have, you're also responsible for getting um, close captions. That's on you. Yeah, they they don't have that stuff for you. It's not like oh we'll take care of it. They're not taking care of anything. They are hosting it. That's it. It's just like. We got it. We got everything you need. You know, thank you. All right, we'll start. We'll start. Start banging them out. And all those those things do is uh, Film Hub, which is you know, all they do is they hey they got they got the hundred outlets that you want to go to, but their job is not to sell your film. It's it's basically you to get all the hits that the other outlets say we'll take that film. So you're never not you're never off the hook with them. You know, you're just never. Your film director should never be off the hook. And if you're in a band, you should never be off the hook. You should always be talking up with your, your, your passion, your art. Yeah, I, I can't tell you how many people I know, like, especially in film, it's like they make the film, they put it out, and oh, it doesn't have any traction. My film's better than everyone's. Why doesn't no one like it? It's like, yeah, dude, you just you don't do anything. There's so many people that won't yeah. break their – they won't put a dime of their own money in, and I think that's like – yeah, it's just so wrong. They you need to tell me you you don't want it bad enough. That's like saying, you know, like uh, in music, there's all those people like, oh, they finally got signed by a by a label, and then the label pays obviously for for the recording, and then the label's like, you're going on tour, right? That's what we agreed on. They'll ask me like, we're not going to go on tour. Well, then your band, what happens? They shove your band into the far corner, because touring bands is how how, how the music gets out there. And that's how they make the most money. Like you, you're yes. not making a lot of money off the streaming. You're only making like three to five dollars per thousand streams. So you know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. So we're I, I, like I'll use like I, I have the dark military logo. Like should have had I should have brought something out to show. But but it's just like the Nike swoosh big drop off my film compared to Nike. But that's property. Like Iron Maiden, Eddie, and those letters. That's property. That's really where it comes down to, like in a band, especially it's like t-shirts. Why, why do you think you're paying 35 to $50 for those t-shirts? That's how the band's getting their money. Yeah. They're, they're not making it off you. The fans most li- most likely are downloading the music illegally and you jump up and down at the show and say, you love the band so much. Like you, you got to win somewhere. So I always yeah. tell film people, you got to make a property. And that's where I always say like, making a, a comedy film that's not good it's really like horror uh like 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 action you know you gotta have something that someone wants to take some merchandise home like the alien predator franchise jason the hockey mask like you gotta invent something that everybody's gonna want if you make a comedy film well, what are you gonna take out of that you laugh for 90 minutes and then you move down with your life there's no profit there and also there's like the audience for comedy films, nobody wants to see an indie comedy movie because they, when they see a comedy movie, they're most likely seeing it because uh, B- B- Bill Bill Murray's in it. You know what I'm saying? Damn right. Yeah. And the, actually, the worst thing a filmmaker can... For anyone out there as a filmmaker, you, know, and you think you have amazing comedy, remember this. They're the worst films to make because... Not that we're saying your film... I'm not saying that you don't have a story, a comedy that ain't going to be... Badass funny, good for you. Problem is, worldwide, what we think is funny in America isn't funny in Europe. What's funny in Europe doesn't work in America. It's the hardest thing to sell. The number one thing that works worldwide is action. Followed and horror, by like and horror. horror movies. Followed by horror movies, because like horror movie fans love, you know, oh wow, movies from France. I'll check that. I'll watch all the subtitles. Like they just love that stuff. Comedy is just hard to sell. It just is uh, globally, you know, Canada, their humor is different than America. It, it's this, you know, it yeah, with, with it's comedy, global. there's always like five layers of context to almost every line and the, the chance of some random person watching it and understanding every layer of context. Like, that's why 
That's why it's like, not going to work. You're, yeah. What you're saying, you, you know what I mean? So now, now you get what I'm talking about. Yeah. Yeah, I get what you're talking about because like there's certain comedy YouTubers or people that I look at like their fan bases. It's always an if you know you know type of fan base, like with a with like an entertainer like Sam Hyde or, or Tim Dillon or something like that. Yeah. Those skits that they post, like like Tim Dillon would do a skit about how he's going in the middle of the woods and he sees a senator in like a uh, eyes wide shut type of mask and he's like, hey senator, what are you doing out here? <laughs> and then the senator's like, oh, we're just going to a meeting to discuss the uh, recent. Uh, elections how did you find me like that type of stuff that takes like layers of context you have to understand of eyes wide shut you have to understand conspiracy theories you have to understand the uh, election crazy things you know what i mean is um mr is um some guy in uh rio de janeiro gonna understand that yeah yeah it's (laughs) almost it, it To take it to exaggerate a little bit, it's almost like if me, you, and I, and your friends, we have inside jokes, and we're saying them in public. Yes! The public doesn't understand what the joke is. They ain't there. They weren't there. They don't know your group. They don't know our group. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah, it's it's, it's very hard with that. It it just is. And... You like me and my friend, we like to, like, repeat stuff to each other, just to, like, piss each other off. Like, I'll ask a question, and he'll be like, he'll, like, he'll be like, um... Be like, what'd you say? Or just you know, some shit like that. Is that what you mean? Yeah. But to you guys, that's hilarious and that works. That's awesome. But to any, you take that out to a different group of people, they're like, yo, those guys are annoying. <laughs> you know, because they don't get the joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah. So I got a question though for the uh, audience. How would you describe the Dark Military as a film to someone who hasn't, you know, seen it? Okay, so Dark Military, I would say uh, I came up with a concept for a group, the first group that like I just thought we were due for one since because we haven't really had one since the Devil Rejects, and uh, I wanted about ten characters, and I definitely wanted some female killers in this too. I wanted to just have a little of everybody. So Dark Military is basically a a general who we don't know with a lot of money hires a bunch of people from the dark web to come out, come out in Halloween and put the fear back in. And it's going to be like an annual thing. And uh, they come from the dark web. Uh, they, they, were, they were basically upset that Halloween got a little too funny and, uh, you know, not scary. And they're going to upgrade it every year with a, with a dangerous game. Uh, for anyone who's ever seen, like, uh, you know, manhunting movies, yeah, there's a page out of that. So or, or read the, the uh, most dangerous game. Yeah. So I always say the concept is like six ingredients. It's like literally early Friday the 13th meets 24, meets Battle Royale, meets Screens, meets the level Devil's Rejects, and meets Mad Max. I literally took like all six of those concepts. Dude, Battle Royale, but, dude, that's a – oh, my. Like I've gotten people – because like all the kids like when I was growing up, they all like, you know, played Fortnite or PUBG. And I would tell them, I'd be like, dude – Go watch the movie. I know you yeah. like, you know, I don't know that you watch movies that much, but I'll be like, if you like the Hunger Games, you'll like Battle Royale, and Battle Royale came out before Hunger Games. so like, Way before that. And, I mean, you had, you had Surviving the Game with Ice-T in 1993. You had Avenging Force in, like, 1989. You had The Running Man. I mean, there's always been, that concept's been out there. I'm not at all saying, oh, I came up with something, you know, that, no way. I just put my own spin of like the dark web and why they're doing it. And all Modern. That. But, yeah. And my whole thing was, is I just want to introduce new horror movie co- icons to the horror community with high production value for an independent movie. Like, like I'm very proud of how well lit my woods were and like how we did it. The fact that I shot that movie in eight days with that many actors with all with, with so many moving parts. And then two years later decided to add Oh, two more days of shooting, um, but this adding on to the story. So in reality, I shot this film, you know, for anyone who wants to check it out, it's free on Amazon and Tubi and Movieplex. I did it all in 10 days, folks. I mean, it, it, was, it was crazy from the literally, it got dark at night to sunrise. And we shot it like the beginning of October. So it was literally like 6.30 to 6.30. It's basically what I call it, 6.30 to 6.30. And it was like straight, straight through. So, um, I got a question about like, you know, the horror community, 
if I want to ever check out like new horror stuff, I usually go end up uh, looking at the Cool Duder YouTube channel. Are you a fan of his channel? Who is it? One more time on cool, YouTube. Cool Duder. Ah, uh, you know what? I uh, I'm sorry, he's great. I, I I don't know who that is. Here's the thing about that. For him, I, I thank him, even though I never, I never watched the show. I thank everybody out there that's constantly pushing films. Thank people like you, you know, you, you, you're, you're getting this story out there. Let me allow me to, you know, tell me my, what happened and uh, the, the promote my movie. It's this, it's this amazing how many people have stepped up in anything, music and horror and all that. I think it's great. And, uh, you basically saying where to find horror movies these days? Is that is that why you brought that up? I'm uh, you are you are, but like I'm talking about like how he um like he's who I look to to figure out about new underground horror stuff, and I'm just saying he's a really good channel. Like what he does is he like he does vlogs where he goes buys new CDs. Like he probably buys like fifty CDs. Like his like for what in a one hour he like analyzes each CD. One will be like uncut gems, and then. One will be like Los Angeles shark attack or some smaller thing. Yeah, yeah That's and awesome. But he also vlogs him acting in short in uh horror films like and stuff like that. And uh, I don't know. I'm just wondering if you knew about him and stuff like. Nah, that. I can't say I did, but it's good that there's people like him out there and others doing that. It's it's important. See where I get my any horror movies that I know, like a lot of people go to Shudder and all that. I get it. And they can go to, you can literally go to Tubi and there's 2000 horror movies. Like I'm like, you know, watch later, watch later. Okay, like, well, what outlets go. do you like? And you were about to explain that, but like, go yeah, to yeah, that. definitely Tubi. I, I go to number one. I think Shudder is great. I just don't, um, I mean like I media know, outlets, they're, they're, like article websites. That's what I meant. My bad. Yeah. 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 But what, what for me straight up where I get the most is, is the horror movie conventions. I like, the way I mark my film, The Dark Bill, I like going up to someone's table and, you know, they had the movie playing and I could see a little bit, I could talk to them and, you know, how passionate were they about this film and all that, you know, like horror conventions are all across the country and uh, I just love that. I love like at the end, I either bought a bunch of Blu-rays or I took a bunch of cards and I got to go home and like, I got shit to watch for a month, you know? And yeah, so that's that's how I kept keep up with it because, you know, back back when the video stores were open, you know, where, where I grew up, I used to go to the video store in a horror section for like four hours, like 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 every other day, and I'd be writing titles down and stuff. And you know, you didn't have the internet back then, so you look at the back back of the box, and you're like, wait, is that the same director as that film Forty Slots over here? You're running back and you're you're double checking. You're like, because it's, it's the same director, I want to watch all his movies, you know. So yeah. It, yeah. It, you didn't have the Google button. Like you guys are all spoiled these I was days in IMDb. Yes. You had to go out and earn that stuff, you know. And then you look at the same box cover and be like, "That's that guy, right? That guy's on that cover too. I like that guy in this movie you know, over there. So I'm probably gonna like this movie." That's how you were picking movies at certain times, you know. I was talking with a you know a fellow creator on another episode of this podcast. We we're talking about why people enjoy the seven the period from the 70s to the 90s you know i was born in the early 2000s so the reason people like that stuff so much is because it was a median period media media was physical you could share it easily it was so much more fun to do that and there was a, a scarcity a slight scarcity to it if that makes sense and um you know the generations moving forward their existence is going to be pretty, like, in terms of enjoying media, is going to be more and more hollow, if that makes sense. In terms of enjoying media, would you agree with what I said? Well, well you, you had it perfect, dude. I, I, I can't tell you I don't like pulling that back in my day. It was better, but, like, the fact that, like I said, I used to go to the video store for, like, four hours, and it was almost tradition. The first thing that I, gra I grabbed, I'm like, I want to see that. That's what I rented, but after four hours of going through every single box, <laughs> I was just, I was, then you're like walking to the counter and you're like, I got three movies here. And you're like, let me rethink this one more time. Cause it was like that whole day would the world was going to end if I rented one of those three movies were going to be bad. My whole life was going to end, you know? So you wanted to go back and double check over and over, but I mean, God forbid, 
it was the greatest was if like two more fans came in of horror movies and then you were just talking. You know, did you ever see this? What'd you think of this? Like word of mouth, like another person, like like not not freaking on a chat board either or or Facebook. It just it was just great meeting fans like that. You know, and then it, 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 I loved being out there. That's one of the reasons I said I, I love the horror movie conventions because they're keeping that alive. The physical still media. At, like, um, what's um, I don't know much about conventions. I know that it's a big fan base, but like, what horror conventions specifically? What areas are they in that you could shout out? Well, for you particularly, because I know you said you're in Delaware, you, you want to check out Monster Mania that takes place in Cherry Hill. So the next one's coming up is August 13th uh, of this year. That's at the Crown Plaza in Cherry Hill. That was my first convention. You got the Days of the Dead convention. That's like across America, like Indianapolis and uh, Atlanta. They're like, they, they go a little everywhere. You have Chiller that goes on up in North Jersey. They seem to bounce around. I would like to tell you exactly where, but they, they seem to bounce around a lot. But, I mean, you got Monster Palooza. I think that's down, like, in, in North Carolina. You got it, but they it's all weekend. There's vendors. There's the horror movie icons that, like, you grew up watching if you're in a horror movie. And you get a chance to go meet them. You'll get to see, like, a Q&A where you could ask them questions about movies. And you know everybody in the world loves to be right about things, like, I know more about this band than you do. I know more about this horror movie than you do. I mean, the fact that there they are and you can ask them a question and get a direct answer. I mean, it's just awesome. It's just like, that's undebatable. They just told you, you heard it right from the lion's mouth. It's just really cool. And just to mingle with the horror, the horror community and all that. But it's, it's, it's so important to me because the first one I ever went to was in 2003 was monster mania. I remember I was like, at a gothic club like this because i'm always a guy was always out and i saw a flyer and it had pinhead on it doug bradley and i'm like this is a convention i was like i was like this is right by me i gotta go to this so yeah and i will win and there's like betsy palmer who is now passed but that was uh jason's mom in the first friday the 13th and kane hotter who played jason and uh uh bill he was the first zombie who, and night of the living dead that attacked barbara like he passed on and all that, but I'm like, oh my God, like this is them. It's like, I'm not watching you on the TV for the 200th time. Like you're right in front of me. This is amazing. So it was like, you ever been I remember a uh, and seen someone from Assault on Precinct 13. Yeah. Yeah, I know what that is. There's yeah, two of them. I'm saying, have you seen like a, um, like a, have you been to a convention and seen an actor from it or anything? That's a really specific huh? question, but. You're talking about like the '70s version? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's only a couple of them still alive, but I they don't jump. That that doesn't jump out at me that any of them, right? I'm trying to think who is the ma- Robert Stahl. Saul, the one that That's a job. really good one. Like I love the, and the soundtrack. I love like I know it's like everybody praises his soundtrack, but it's a pretty it, good soundtrack. It it's crazy because in the last 20 years the cons got so big and like i said the ones i was naming you people have already passed and stuff but like it's amazing how many of them like you met like there's almost i'd say i've met 92 percent of the horror community anything you could ever think of yeah there's almost like there's just those few that like they either they don't want to leave their house or maybe you know they they, they just don't want to meet the fans or they're maybe 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 they're ill I mean, you do have people that have medical problems and, you know, can't, can't be out, but like, man, I met like every Robert England, you know, everybody from the tech, the Texas chainsaw massacre, like all of them, like everybody. And it's crazy. Cause when the lost boys, like everything you could think the monster squad, I mean, the, the list goes on and on. It's just endless. It's like, wow. Like you're, about to, you're, you're inviting me in a rabbit hole that I will dive into. Okay. <laughs> In the future, uh, maybe this summer, who knows? I'll, what's that one? Monster Mania. I'll write that down. Monstermania.net. But you can also obviously follow Facebook. They just announced, like I said, that's August 13th. That's a Friday the 13th. So it looks like so far they're bringing in people Friday the 13th. And you brought up Joe Bob Briggs. I don't know if he's going to be at the one in Cherry Hill. But Monster Mania also runs. I would love Maryland. to interview him, like just straight up. So like. I believe Monster Mania has another one in Maryland on September 25th. I believe Joe Bob is booked for that. 
He's there all weekend in Maryland. You, yes, look that up. You might get your chance to meet him finally. Yeah, I'd like to, cause I like doing like sometimes if I know that I gotta catch someone like I've been to a show before for like a rap, you know a local musician, and I would be like, okay, I can't do a podcast at a show a venue, you know, I'll just v- vlog it up, and I just went up to this random guy, I was like, yo, use my camera, give me a sec, <laughs> I'm like, stay here for ten minutes, and, and then I'm like getting my little, I'm just like doing a, you know, I'm saying I do a vlog interview with him. And stuff like that. If I were to interview him, but shout to what? What? It, how long have you been like watching Joe Bob Briggs? Like in general, if you watch, yeah, much? I don't know, man. How long? How long has he been doing that? You know, like he. I, I don't know. I can't honestly say. I don't know if like is he still doing that show anymore? Is he still doing like host hosting and making fun of? Is he still roasting? I don't. I don't know if he even is anymore. I think he has a show on Shutter that recently thing, and he did a one an episode of Chud. Uh. You know, we should just talk about Chud, because, like, that's, like, one of my favorite movies. I contacted him about my film. I was just like, yo, yo I wanted to know his price to, like, plug slash roast my movie. Like, I, I didn't care. I was like, come after. And he was all about it, but, like, he never got back. He's a guy who seems to, like, or email you back every other, like, fourth month. So it got, he kind of got lost in my shuffle. But I was like, I don't care if you slander my film. Go for it. But it's like, I want to jump off rings, you know, that plug it but but again that again that's what i'm saying as an independent filmmaker like i would pay that price that's the, just to get just to get that audience you got to do that like, you got to push your craft whether it's music or film you, you you can't just make it and then just be like yo why is everybody not running get running at me i always tell people like you can't just make a facebook page and a you a, 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 like a trailer on youtube and expect you took over the world it's, it doesn't work that way you gotta get out there. You gotta meet the fans. Yeah, it works that way for the uh, the Safdie brothers or whoever has a huge fan base. I'm a big fan of the Safdie brothers, though. Have you ever like gotten into any of their shorts or analyzed their career? I don't know if you've watched the Safdie brothers movies or stuff. Short films. I ran 26 short film festivals in Philadelphia. Freedom Shorts, yeah, Liberty Mass. Freedom Shorts. Yeah, I was gonna ask about that. Yeah, yeah, anybody can put that in on YouTube and you can watch all the video highlights from all that where we literally kind of, you know, show you around the venue. You meet some of the filmmakers. We talk about what's going on and it's over with within five to seven minutes because we know the world has a short attention span. But yeah, I screened over a thousand uh, short films from around the entire world. And that was mostly out of the Trocadero in Philadelphia and Chinatown. Then I did spread out to like, Philly Mocha and, 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 and a few other venues and stuff. And I did that from 2000, 2012 until 2019. Um, yeah, over the span of seven years. I'm talking about it in a past tense, like it's over. I don't know if it's over. If, uh, the last show I had was uh, 2019, October 4th and 5th. And then came 2020, and you know, if you know, if I wanted to have a show, it wasn't going to happen. But some of the venues I just mentioned to you uh, went under. So there are there other places I could screen? Sure. I don't know. There's another part of it. Like I have a lot going on film wise. I don't know if I'm going to be able to have time to do that. So I'm not saying it's done. I'm just saying for right now. Hiatus. Yeah, hiatus. Yeah. I don't want to say it's done because I, do, I did really love running those shows. I just have to be cloned. It's the only way I know. I have to be cloned so if I, another one of me can run that, you know, why why everything else doesn't stop. Well, you know? Illuminati, uh, you have a potential candidate, a potential potential member that would like to be cloned so he could do more for his films. There we go. So hit up, hit up Lauren right now. <laughs> email i don't know i don't want to disclose your email but you can email you could email him you could message me if you want his email and i'll i'll, I'll set it up i'll set up you in with an illuminati membership you, you got one of them fake uh bots oh that, god yeah 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 dude yeah talk about that, oh it's was great there was another one that i got that i didn't post yet where the guy said i would make uh two billion dollars a year if i joined and i started two billion folks and I was like, I'm gonna have fun with this guy. So I said two billion, and I put a question mark. He goes, Yes, two billion. I was like, That's kind of low. I go, <laughs> I, I go. I like to discuss the rate. It went on forever. 
I was like, I think I'm worth six. I was just like, it's, it's just so upset. The guy was going back and forth with me, like, like not getting mad at me. He was just like, you know, like, oh, well, my we'll friend. See you get yeah, it was crazy. So I was getting ready to post all that, but I'm trying to trying to get them all in order so people could follow the joke. <laughs> and I said, "What do you want me to WhatsApp do?" WhatsApp thing? Don't they get you to like get sign a WhatsApp group or some shit like Telegram? You ever gotten one of them where they like? Uh, I think they all they were trying to do is eventually get your bank account numbers and actually reverse your money. Is all I think what the scam is. You know? Yeah, yeah. So, so I got one of them uh, recently. It was like. I don't know. I don't want to speak on what he was asking me. No. Okay. So I got like a crypto. I think it was like a crypto thing. And they're like, I need to ask, I need to log into your cash app so I can give you the money. And I'm like, dude, uh -huh. just pay me with my uh, tag. Uh, cash dollar sign, capital M, money man, 0845, anybody feeling generous with donations? Anyway, fuck out of here. Anyways. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I was like, dude, just pay me the normal way. People pay people. It's like someone asking, "Can I have your PNC bank login?" Oh uh, no! Hey, take it, take everything. My social security. Anytime I get like a spam, I usually get excited like that because I try to keep them going. Yeah. The same thing when a lot of people hang up um, with uh, when, when you get a freaking telemarketer. I always listen to them and listen to their pitch, and I try to hold them on if I have the time. For as long as I can. To make them question their existence. Over and over and over. And like they'll explain it and I'll keep re asking and rewording. And I'll keep them on for an hour if I could. If I have the time and I'll work a character that I'm working on is what I'm doing. I'm using them. And you can talk to one. They're getting really pissed off that I'm not that just, you know. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> yeah, so it's yeah. funny. I, I do that. The same thing with the webcam girls. When they say like you want to see crazy stuff. And like I always ask them like. Well, don't you want to look at me? I'm like, I only charge you three ninety nine. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh, you were you pull the Uno reverse card on? Oh, uh, I do a reverse, and then I try to explain to the girl that like I'm better looking than you. So like, I don't know why, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they get mad, right, asshole, or something, or they 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 just stop talking. Yeah, yeah. I always try to have fun with that. When people get mad at stuff like that, like I, if I have time. I will, I will go opposite. I will chase them and just reverse it. Yeah, like, I, I don't know. Like, I, I've, um, I usually don't do this. I'm not, like, a person who frequents cams or whatever the fuck. I don't really do that that much. But one time Never. I did recently, and, like, they're kind of assholes, a majority of them. Like, I'm like, yo, show me, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, coins. And I'm like, what? What's that mean? And, and then I, like... And then, like, of course, an advertisement pops up where it's like, for two ninety nine for a hundred coins, and I'm like, yeah, exit out. <laughs> you know, I'm good. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they're yeah. they're really like, I don't know, man. I'm not I'm not a sugar daddy. Don't hit me up. I'm not. Yeah, no, nah, I've never I've never gotten there, but I just have like I said, have fun with anything. You got to make the best entertainment that you can out of your life. You said you were working on a character. That, what do you, are you uh? Were you just like saying like you're improvising some funny shit or like? Are well, you actually I mean, working when, when, when someone is, hires me as an actor, uh, the first thing I do, obviously, I go through script and obviously I, I I try to get the lines down. But then like I'm constantly talking to the director, like you know, uh, like I'll call him and be like, I have three different action beats for this character. I need to know where you want me. And now, like, I, I might just do a certain voice, like, you know, like, I, you know, what I what I feel. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, that's it. Stay right there. You're good. And other times I could be practicing the, that, that character and then get too into it and be like, shit, is this what the director wants? So I'll call him and be like, yo, this is how I pictured this character you gave me. And I'll deliver the line and be like, that's not how I want it at all. See, I always tell people, like, Get your lines down, but find out from the director the best way, you know, the way they want, their, they, they expect you to perform and then go after it, you know? So when I get at someone like that, uh, you know, a telemarketer, that's a chance I could practice the character. Like I know Jonah Hill does that. Jonah Hill will call like a, like a place like he's having trouble with his TV and he'll just turn into the character and hold them as long as he possibly could just to practice, you know, just, just, just to get practice. And they don't know who they're talking to. Yeah. On I mean, Jonah Hill though, 
have you seen mid nineties? Yes, I love that film. I can't tell you how much I, I can't tell you how much I love that film. I I fortunately grew up with two good parents, but I literally related to that kid, the star. For me, it's the brother scenario, the brother dynamic. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, well, I didn't have a brother either, but the fact that he was watching the cool kids with a skateboard from a distance and is trying to look for a way in, that's what I was like as a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you're, you're smiling and laughing from a distance, hoping somehow. And what they do, they made fun of him, but eventually, like, you got in. I really relate to that. And Jonah, smart motherfucker, because all those kids are a part of a huge, like, 2 million subscriber YouTube channel called Illegal Civ. Like that's where he found them from. So like, there's these kids like like that have their own you know sort of skater slash music collective filmmaker collective. The leader of the collective actually is a really good filmmaker. Uh, his name's like Mick. He he wasn't in the movie, but his boys were in the movie. Like his home, the the main character is a part of a legal civ. Uh, legal civilization is what it's saying. Nickel the Nickel Smith is a rapper, but he's also he was the kid with the dreadlocks in the movie. Yeah, and um, shit. <laughs> yeah. like he was able to tap into that culture so smoothly, but he also was totally making some nostalgic movie that he himself probably enjoys to this day. You know what I mean? Like, do you say that you want to make stuff when you're on your filmmaking stuff? Are you making stuff so that you could just rewatch it and enjoy it yourself? Or are you making it for other people or a mixture? Well, well, well so far, I mean. Like I said, I made some short films that you could see on my website, but I don't really push them because that, that was me still learning. You know, I have no problems anybody like looking at that. But Dark Military and Pennsylvania Hardcore, which is a documentary, they're the only two films I, I got out being an independent filmmaker, and there was a lot of work to go into that. Um, I look at it, I'm still beginning. The Dark Military was the introduced new horror movie icon. The real films that I want to make, I don't want to be just known as a horror director. Mine's all like drama. I want stuff like that, like the 90s. You know, stuff like, like I said, I related to that kid who would see all those skateboards. Like, hey, I want to be a part of that. You know, like, to me, like, The Breakfast Club and Stand By Me, like, I love stuff that you can't run from, everyone can relate to, uh, and, and still go there. You know? There are people like, you, you can still go there. And it's still, like, touching because... Even in a land of like computers and you know whatever YouTube and your cell phone, you can't escape the part of being human. And I love films like that. You know? Like the Breakfast like, Club because the Breakfast Club can like always relate to somebody. It doesn't have to be oh we're in detention and we all get to meet each other. It could be like it could be like you're at work and nobody and you're really bored because you don't have anything to do because you work at a restaurant and nobody's ordering anything for like two hours. So all you're doing is sitting with people that you barely get to talk to, and then you finally get to know them. You might go out back and smoke with them. I'm may, may or I may or may not be speaking with personal experience right here. Um, but you know what I mean though. Like, what movies Look, I, are real personal? The Breakfast Club to me is so such a perfect ten film, and I mean you could really sum up the movie in seconds by just basically saying it's like, oh, it's five strange kids that are all completely different, but they all have one thing in common. They're all scared. They're, they're, they're just scared. They're just trying to get by, you know? Like, future, regardless of what whatever color they're wearing, they all have problems. And in the end, they're all scared and they're emotional, you know? Everybody cried at one point of, of that, you know? Or at least freaked out, you know? Like, you realize, like, no, no one's safe. We're all just trying to get through this high school. Who, what kids can't can't relate to that you yeah, know yeah and also like i could i could i could rant i could say so much about that movie but like i think what's be- good about that movie is like they're all uh how you kind of said they're all kind of different from each other and then you know you you know that when you watch the movie that in the um when there if there was a scene and i think there is probably a scene that it's like the normal school day. Those kids probably aren't going to go up to like each other, if that makes no. sense. No. They never... I always like... said, it, it, you, you, you leave it alone, but like, how crazy would have been a sequel if like Monday, they all walked by each other that, that, in the sequel and they just went back to their... Because I bet you that's what happened. I bet that was a flash in the pan and that was the end of it, you know? Yeah. 
You know what I mean? Maybe if they're by themselves and no one else see, they'd say hi to each other. But like, yeah, I bet, I bet you, you know how that is. You know, like, hey, oh, I, I'm going to go all summer. And then when I come back to school in September, I'm going to be this type of person. And within two days, you fall back in line. You know, you know that happens. You know, it, it, it's rough being a kid. I mean, you know, you look at it with things like that back when you when you get older and be like, yeah, why didn't I? You know, why didn't I just make the best of it? Why couldn't I do it? And it's a simple reason. It's the same routine. You did the same routine for 12 years. You don't realize, like, you know, this is senior year. We're walking off stage, and you're not going to see. <laughs> you're not going to see a lot of these people ever again. You know, ever again. Like, like you're not thinking about that part. You know? Because, so I always say, like, like, try, to, try to be the best you can to each other while you're there and just enjoy it. But I also understand that like scariness, you know, school was scary. It was awesome, but it was also scary. You know, you don't want to get picked on. You don't want to get beat up. You want to have the best time you want to, but at the same time, you you want to be popular. You don't want to be too popular. I mean, you go, you know, it is, it depends who you ask, but like, those are the motions. Yeah. What, um, how do I say this? What sort of relationship oriented movies do you like drama wise? I'm asking in general. Like what kind of dramas do I like? Like what type of relationship dramas do you like? It could be a romance, it could be a family. I love the most like I I like when it's a group of kids like the mid 90s like Stand by Me. I've always liked the the first Stephen King's it from 1990. I've always loved like between the ages of 11 and like 13 cuz I always who can't relate to that on their block with like all the neighborhood kids of like before City high of school, God, basically dude. before hormones in high school got to all of you, how much you stuck up for each other. I just think it's just a great time. You know, I love movies like that. Even with girls, like whatever, like I just love kids that stuck up for each other, no matter what looked out for each other. I just love movies like that. I have a question. Have you um seen the film City of God? The no, Bruce? I have not. Oh man! Yeah, I gotta put you on right now. So <laughs> it's a Brazilian crime film about it's essentially a sort of it's through the lens of a photographer child who wants to be a photographer. He's always wanted to be a photographer, but he lives in the city of God, which is a small, poor area of uh, Rio de Janeiro. And he's seen all his friends either become gang members or drug dealers or like prostitutes and stuff like that. So he documents a lot of what he sees. It's based on a true story. Through his photography, he documents an entire gang war. His like he um he becomes like the personal photographer for like a gangster. And he basically documents a whole gang war between like uh two sections of the city. And it's all through the span from like the '60s to like the early '80s, and it's one of the my favorite um, gangster films because it's not like Goodfellas where at the end of it he's like, "Oh man, I'm in the suburbs and I hate my life." Wait. Yeah, yeah. At the end of it, it's real positive. He's like, "I got out. I'm a photographer now. Okay, I'm a, I'm working for a high big. I'm a, working for a big paper company. You know what I'm saying?" But you see him through when he's probably about like eight years old to like when he's about like probably 18 and it's called city of god is that what you just said city of god i'll write that down now (laughs) yeah it's like it's um oh my god man that's that's a good one i got do you like a lot of gangster movies or foreign you know what man i mean i'm full italian too like (laughs) I've growing up, I loved all that, but it, it really is a dead topic. I just think the the, the market was so saturated with them that yeah. like I don't get it's like the last like you just had to say gangster movie that I liked was American Gangster. Like I I and I'm, I'm sorry, I also a lot. It's like cut down the middle. To me, it's the old people loved it, and and the, the newer generation hated it. But I love the Irishman. That I love that. I thought that was perfectly it's, it's a beautiful movie film wise and everything's beautiful i like the story. movie but i like making fun of it 
if that makes you're sense. Not, you're not going over the facial thing. That's not why. You can't be, right? No, it's like um like I like Tim Dillon did a bit where he was like he was like making fun of like a uh, 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 film fans. He was like um he was like this new movie it's like you're watching corpses. They might as well reanimate corpses from the dead and shit like that. And then he's yeah, like, uh, but I, I couldn't believe when people were like, "I was mad." I'm like, I want the, what they what they expect they were gonna see Joe Pesci at that age, like like snap, like were you were they try? What were, what were people expecting? You had to know they were all gonna be old. I think it would have worked really better as a uh, anime. Is a not an animated? What the fuck did I? I mean, I just a <laughs> limited series. That's what I meant. It would have been a really good, like, four-part limited I'm, series. I'm very big on history. So, like, the fact, like, through the whole Hoffa thing and, like, you're explaining, like, oh, it's a lot to do with Philadelphia and Old Forge, Pennsylvania. Like, I just love hearing all, And I thought it was, like, it's great on every character that you saw. Like, they told you how they died, like, right next to it, like, as the movie oh, yeah, went yeah, on. yeah, yeah, yeah. I just thought that was it, – it's a lost time because they're really – like I say, there's no mafia, but like they're not what they used to be. Like it, it's it, it's kind of like a gone thing now. Like yeah, like at the of, end, the FBI is like, we don't care. Everybody yeah. you're talking about is dead. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I like that. I liked watching it, but um, I don't know that I'd go back and watch it again. I did. Uh, I think I I think I watched it like seven times, dude. Like I. It's also I'm a big fan of people like Scorsese because it's like the montages as much as like we've been dominated by special effects and like the marvel universe for the last 20 years and sure a lot of those films are good but like they're all effects films like like the fact you know they made the effect for the final scene of endgame in 2016 you know they literally did that they were working on the effects for that movie in 2016 endgame yeah that's what the you know what i mean yeah, yeah. I mean, look at it, and and uh, uh, what do you call it? like the Guardians of the Galaxy? Like that's all like the way to make it look like that. I mean, that's a lot of work to make the entire movie make have that special effect on it. So like, I get it, but so I'm all, I'm all I'm big on like those older people like that, like Scorsese, like like you're making a film. There's no superhero. It's like you're you're just homaging what the past was because I'm. I'm extra scared on a global scale of this, like, in the next 50 years, because, you know, between YouTube and, you know, your cell phone, I'm not, like, are we going to, is, is everything going to be forgotten? You know, everything from the 50s, is Elvis going to be forgotten? Like, like, oh, yeah, that guy used to swing his hips. Anyway, moving on. Like, I just don't know. It scares me. You know, like, oh, is the Goonies going to be like, oh, this is, this can't be and stupid. We don't, we, why, why, why? The Goonies is finished. Like, I don't know. Are you scared that people are going to look at the Goonies the same way people now look at the Three Stooges old version? Well, like, possibility. And, and, like, the Mita Stooges are absolutely brilliant. I still, like, I, I think they're amazing. I still, I think it's mostly a guy thing. <laughs> Us guys always love the Stooges, but, like, they were so brilliant, that art that they did. And, and the fact that, like, their story about how they weren't being paid well, the fact that they were like theater actors with no sound effects. So when it was time to hit, it was an open palm strike to get a sound to go through the whole theater. They had to really hit each other back then. You know, when you watch the students on TV, you heard that boom, like, yeah, that, that, that's an effect button. But, but to build up to that, they really were waffling each other. They may have not been giving each other black eyes and bloody noses, but they had to hit full contact. There was no... They weren't looking up for each other like that. Same way when like people realize like in the Wizard of Oz, you're talking about a film from the late 30s, early 40s. I always love I love that film, but when you watch the scarecrow do all his dances, the guy jumps up in the air and slams his knees into the ground over and over. And I'm like, you know they weren't looking up for him back then. Like, like you know this guy was destroying his body for his art. Like now you got the Screen Actors Guild. Like, that would never fly. You're like, oh, you got to, it's got to be styrofoam on the ground. The actor can't be hurt. I mean, but people did back then. I just I just hope people, I hope that is never forgotten. You know, like, do people ever talk about Gone with the Wind? 
maybe more girls, you know, it is kind of more of like the romantic, all the, you know, Prince Charming and all that, but I just really am scared in the next 50 years that like everything that was cool from the past, is it going to hold up? I really, I, I, I'm nervous of that, you know? I, uh, I have a proposition about that that I've talked with many people about. Is that, and this might sounds a bit depressing, but it, I'm going to mix it in with something. Is that the film industry is going to become like a mixture of theater people and fans with comic book fans. It's going to be mixed together. That fan base is never going to go away. Just like theater fans never go away. They never go away. There's always, like, there's still a kid, like, you know what I'm saying, that are interested and they still do it. There's always a local theater thing going on. I'm saying like the film industry is going to be like that, where there's always going to be um, people interested and in liking it, but it's going to, and being historically knowledgeable about it, but it's going to be in a very limited and if you know, you know capacity. You know what I mean? Well, it's like, that, that, that's called niche audiences, like with the horror community, with the convention and stuff. Same thing what you're saying. Like, I'm saying it's going to happen for audience, films things- overall, or maybe, I don't know. Yeah, but I mean the the theaters have been going away. Um, if, if you really think about it, like I hate saying because this is total hypocritical about what happened with distributor and stuff, but I'm not a big fan of going to the movie theater, and it has nothing to do with the movie theater experience. I, I that's great. It's mankind that I don't like at the theater. I don't like seeing flashing phone. I don't like teenage kids talking. I don't like the old couple that keeps saying, I don't know what's happening because they can't hear. Like, it, it, you know, there's this, it, it, when I pay to see a movie, I want it to be in peace. I just do. And the fact that like things come right to your television now, I rather pay the rental fee, have access to my own bathroom, to be able to pause it whenever I want, you know, be able to go to my refrigerator, you know, and to be able to pause and be like, yo, Drew, I got to go to the bathroom. Give me five. Yeah. Whatever. <laughs> what, what, whatever you want to do, you rented it through the day. Hell, you could watch half of it and go cut your lawn and come back. Like, like I, I don't advise that. Cause then you're out of I'm room. very weird with movies. I watch like 30 minutes go. Like, I don't know, work on a video, work on content. Work I like to go straight through the only thing I've ever and because obviously there's not a lot of four hour movies but when the Snyder Cut came out I did two hours and I stopped and I was like all right that was fire I, I love that movie though that was I really loved cool. it so much oh it God. really was a, it really is a masterpiece and I do think Zack Snyder's the way he betrays those characters the cinematography I think it's the most realistic the way those those characters look Marvel is total CGI like, they're trying to make a comic book. I think Zack Snyder is trying to make a film. And yeah, I just yeah, think he's, oh my God. He's one, he's a, he has this amazing fan base. He's accepted within the mainstream. He is a bright, shining filmmaking star that I'm so glad has like that mainstream love and exposure. And he had, and he's able to create great content like 300 is a fucking masterpiece like 300 yep yeah so yeah i I love that i i think he made the best comic book movie ever i like the watchman more than anything you'll ever see and i love the way yeah dude that's oh my god i hate these watchman comic book snobs like watchman is a great movie i understand yes uh alan moore wrote the uh in 1983 at the height of the I, the, I, those are the same people that, like, when The Walking Dead was in its prime, were like, oh, Dale's character does not die until it's like, oh, would you shut up? It's like, yo, it's not going to go exactly how you read it in a comic book, dude. Chill. Like, chill. Like, you know, I always like these people that try to up one. Like, well, in Star Wars, this shouldn't have happened, so this, like, stop it. Like, if you're the only one with this information. <laughs> you know? It's like, well, it's, yeah, yeah, like even though Rise of Skywalker was fucking garbage, I enjoyed it at the theater. I was like, it was like I'm, it was like I'm uh, w- watching like, it, it, I don't know what it was like, but it was like so fat. It's like I'm watching Casino almost. Like everything's happening at like twice the speed. I love Casino though, but the reason, 
back on Scorsese though, unpopular opinion, Casino is better than Goodfellas. What do you think about that? Uh, to me, okay, I'll say two things. To me, it doesn't matter. This is this like saying like I gonna I got a double cheeseburger for you or I got a chili burger. Like either way. It's a grand slam. I don't care which one you give me. You yeah. could have the other one. I, I, so the thing I always say, there's an enormous error in the two of those films. And I, I always pointed out that like Joe Pesci is five foot two. I'm not scared of Joe Pesci in any way, shape or form. If you look at the real Nicky Santoro from the Casino. Well, wasn't he six he four? Was six foot five. Yeah. That guy was six foot five. I could see why you're scared of him. Like, I mean, someone's like, yo, Joe Pesci's coming to beat you up. <laughs> That's kind of cute. Like, he's just, I'm sorry, it's small. I'd be, I'd be like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just put your hand out. <laughs> Look at the little kids trying to get to me. But it's kind of interesting if you ever see uh, read the real story of what happened in the casino. Like, a lot of it obviously happened. Or, or watch the History Buffs video about it. Oh, my gosh. It's so freaking good, though. You're like, wow. Like, some of the crazy... History, shouts out to History Buffs. I really like their channel. Are, they, are you familiar with what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. But uh, Scorsese, I mean, you know, to me, he's like, he's the taxi driver guy. I will, I will always say, you know, I'm like, like yeah, you're, yeah, you're a taxi driver guy. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, I, I, I obviously I got I'm a movie. punk rocker, so I always would go with that. Yeah, so yeah. So that's traffic. your favorite, that's your favorite Scorsese film? By far, yeah, yeah. I like, uh, I mean, Obviously, who doesn't love Casino and uh, Goodfellas? I mean, God, I mean, you can go on forever with him. I mean, look, 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 look at his library; it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know? Um, what I love about Taxi Driver is it has that sort of how do I say this? It's very Darkness, in, it's, what was New York? Yeah. <laughs> it's as intimate as Mean Streets. Like Mean Streets is a very intimate movie. You're going, you're seeing their smelly apartment. You know, there's scenes in their dirty ass little apartment and they're like talking about like their like relationships. Yes, there's some gang shit going down and there's a fight. He called me a mook. You what well, you call me a mook? Yeah, yeah, you can't call us mook, Sad, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what's a mook? That's the best part. What's a mook? <laughs> what's a mook? And then they start fighting. There's All I the- know is it's an insult and you can't call them that, but they don't know the definition. That's like the best. that's my favorite part of that whole movie. <laughs> yeah, and their music rising that has nothing to do with what they're fighting about, but it's yeah. fucking cool, man. Like, he can do that. It was the 70s, I assume, paying for the music to be in the movie did not cost that much. It probably cost um, probably two outfits that I'm wearing right now, but... um, Actually, it cost a lot more in the past than now. Now is like, you could get a song so much more cheaper, but like back in the day, as soon as when they started pressing... VHS tapes, that's when the music industry said, we want the most money we could possibly get because they look at how many copies you're going to press to make money off of them. You know, like, yeah, so that's where music rights came up. That's why, like, it took until about six years ago for the Wonder Years finally to get released because they had so many songs from the 60s and 70s that they could not get the right papers like like taken care of so those, those bands made out without cutting them. Well, so how, that's why it took so long for that DVD to finally come out. I think they got every song but two. Like there was two is it, it's, it's crazy because what music writes, someone, there could be seven people that own the rights to a song, and if one of those people don't agree, it don't work. You yeah, know? Yeah, there's certain, um, I was going to ask you a question about something else, but now I want to bring up something. There's certain f- songs, uh, you know, for instance, like a Playboy Cardi track uh, leaked, he made a song called uh, he, it has two names, but I'm gonna the song's called Pissy Pamper, and it samples some Japanese song from like 1970 whatever. And you can't do that without permission, yeah. Yeah. So what happened is he leaked the somehow the track got leaked, and like it gets removed every week from YouTube because some fan reuploads it, and now it's like one of these huge songs. But n- the fans they all agree, and they all know. That it will never be on all platforms, and he will never be able to perform it at a show because of 
whoever owns the rights to the the, the Japanese song. It's a, it, it comes down strictly on YouTube too. Like uh, Vince McMahon, Dana White have people that they pay to go through YouTube and look for any content that they own. That 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 yeah, to, to get it down. Like Vince McMahon literally has that. Like the pay per view hits. They ask people he pays that are like, there it is. There's the Royal Rumble. You know, report it, get it down. Yeah, there's uh, a podcaster who sh- who um who literally went on a podcast and was like, I pirate. He was like, yeah, I pirated this episode of some new fight, probably like the Jake Paul fight. Yeah, and he has a fucking lawsuit. Yeah, because he just said that. No, well, I mean you're also admitting to it. It, it in reality, uh, I, I get it. I get we I know I know what you're you're saying like all these people are making so much money, but you're also stealing. I I, I I get it as being the creator the same way like he's gone now and his family completely sold all his music out, but like Prince had that. He had people that twenty four seven, if you uploaded one of his songs, flag, get it down. You know, but then he died and they're making every bit of money they possibly could off his music. But I mean, that's property. Vince McMahon, that's his yeah. property. Dana White, that's their property. You know, if you, if you make something, that's your property. You have the choice of basically saying, no, come here, pay for it properly, or, yeah, go ahead, take it. You know, that's up to you. Because when you're on a um, – because I'm making an assumption right now, but if you're part of a huge corporation that distributes it, you most likely have a robot that figures it out or people that you hire to figure out if something's posted about you. But, like, right now, if, like, a bunch of people – like, if someone – which is what happens with a lot of podcasts. If they make a channel devoted to uploading clips of my videos, yeah, I'd be like, yeah, dude. Like I literally pay people to like. Sometimes I pay people to like upload my clips because they there's channels that just upload clips of other people's podcasts. They have like a big following, so sometimes I pay people I'm like, yo, I got a new interview out. Here's a ten minutes. I yeah. email it to them and stuff like that. But, but, recently, Rogan, but if you have a yeah. set fan base and you don't need that, then someone else could possibly make money off yeah. of your shit. And that's what we're talking about. You, you think you think Joe Rogan, who got signed to a $100 million contract to Spotify, cares if someone uploads that show to YouTube? He got his money. You don't care. Yeah. He, he ain't going to care. Yeah. So, but for Dana White and like Vince McMahon, they got a lot of people they got to pay. So each pirate is taking money out of it. I, I, I understand, you know, yeah. a lot of people look at it like, Oh, you got too much money. Well, don't be, don't be greedy. But I, I also understand like, it's not one person. The WWE is like, a huge office. UFC is a big office. But what I would not say, all off, each fighter gets a percentage of that. Yeah. But you're, you're basically taking purse money out away. I, I know, you know, so so there is a uh, creator, independent creator, and I want to say that if you're going to be going online and uploading clips of somebody else's shit, like a movie clip or some shit, do it out of a fan and don't do it out of uh, – do it as a fan who just wants to put it out there for yourself or something like that. Don't do it to make money off of it because there's this channel that's out there, and he was uploading clips of like somebody's uh, independent subscription patron service. So he was uploading clips of that shit. And then he, he, he builds, like, he probably gets, like, 1,000 subscribers, probably more subscribers in this channel, because I have, like, 1.4. And he starts making merch and selling fan merch. And it's like, yeah. dude, how pissed would you be if someone's, like, making money off of the dark, uh, you know, no, your sorry. movie? Like, well, I mean, when, when you're at the horror movie conventions, there's all these vendors that come up with this great art, like, all these big painting of freddie and jason and michael myers having lunch at a table like it's the most beautiful shit but like i'm not gonna sit there and ask for their identification and all that and prove it but like friday the 13th is owned by new line cinema but you know like are they getting a cut of that the devil's rejects like is rob zombie getting a cut of that oh did you press that shirt you, you sure that devil's reject shirts like rob zombie and and uh, you know uh, they get in a cut in Lionsgate. Are they get in a cut of that. Like, did, so it's like I get you're making money and you're, you're you know it, it's a compliment to the fans, but like none of those people are getting that money. I know they're not. 
And I'm not gonna guy a guy that's gonna stop you at the table. I mean, I'm not no, but like you're just a guy that's aware, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, you're just aware. But that's why I say when, I, when you're just brought to dark military, there's a part of me like, oh, someone took my logo and was pressing the shirts. Well, clearly my film's getting some traction. That's a compliment, but uh, damn, I just got hit with a credit card bill for three grand, and uh, I could use that money. That guy just sold about ten of my shirts. We got a problem. You know, like, or at least, yeah, yeah, or at least get get the right paperwork and get it, and you know, make sure I get a cut of it. You know, there's there's always a way. Uh, I'm not at that part yet. I don't have to, you know. Unfortunately, my film's not where I want it to be yet. I'm still working on that, hopefully. But I see it out there. I see it out there all the time. You know, it's just like uh, outside outside of a sporting event, uh, you, you'll see the, the the band plays. And you, you can buy the T-shirt inside for fifty dollars, or you can wait outside and someone's selling the same T-shirt for ten bucks. You know, it, it, it's great. Yeah, you know what I mean. It's like, yeah, I just paid a hundred dollars for a ticket. Why well, pay fifty for the T-shirt? I'll buy the one outside. But at the same time, the band's not making the money the way they should. I should buy that T-shirt inside. You know. So, how did you? Uh, I assume you're very connected within, like, a, you know, certain music communities. How did you, uh, with the f- soundtrack to the dark, you know, military was a lot of, um, you knew, did you know majority of the bands personally? I knew everybody personally or it wouldn't have happened. So basically, uh, like the Green Lady Killers and Stormwatch and Animal House. Delaware and- band, right? One of them's yeah. Delaware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's uh, Stormwatch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, the singer Jeff is in the movie. He's one of the guys, uh watching the pod the, the broadcast and uh i knew all these people and uh i i knew were songs that would fit as i was making the movie and i was like all you could do was ask you know so you, you get this you get the clearance make sure the credit up properly but yeah like i didn't i didn't call the only band that i wanted there was a rockabilly band called the chop tops where i called their management and i was just like Song Vegas Lights, I really want this for a particular part. And I mean, they're a popular rockabilly band, but like, when I say popular, there's not a lot of popular rockabilly bands. Basically when a Chop Top shows up, there's a hundred people. I'm like, they wanted, they wanted so much money. Like it wasn't even close to being reasonable. Like I knew I was gonna pay, I was willing to pay. But when you're just like, wow, like, I don't know what you're thinking here, but. Yeah, but the price was just was just absurd to me. I was like, no, that was the only song I didn't get. But the fact that um was been in the Pennsylvania hardcore scene since 1993, I a lot of these people were my friends. Yeah, it's so, like like for me, like when you're I'm a part, I'm very tapped in with a lot of underground uh, funk rap, G funk rap, a lot of underground horrorcore. I'm tapped in with a lot of rappers. If I make a short film, dude, I'm fine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'll just talk to my, like, because no, none of these people that I interview, like, I'd say, like, 5% of them are on labels. You know what I'm saying? Or, like, I have interviewed someone on Empire, UMG, Doom Shop, like, like, but a majority of them are just, like, uploading it from their computer, and that's what I love, because when you're able to talk with them about their underground music, man, it's, like, it's just such, I think, underground entertainment is so fun to be involved with like let's just let's agree on that is because you're so you're able to interact with everybody man everybody's a lot of people like they want to be invited into some secret fucking club you know i'm saying that they think it really exists well when i got into the hardcore scene in the early 90s like there was there's no internet like i basically accidentally wandered into a show i thought it was like a heavy metal show and i was like what 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 is this like they're not moshing like well, why is that guy throwing a karate kick at his friend but i was like is that his friend or is he warning him to get away from him? I, didn't, I didn't understand what was going on and i was really scared but i couldn't leave i was just so drawn to, i was like what's happening here like so the next bunch of months in a row like i kept going to every show i could and i just sat in the corner kind of just like I hope, I hope they don't just run around and punch people for no reason. I don't want to get hit. You know, and this little by little, you know, you work your way up the ladder. But I used to have to drive to the mall 
to look for flyers. That's how I found out where the next show was. Like I had to earn that. I had to drive where I grew up outside of Scranton. I had to drive 16 miles to the mall, 32, uh, you know, round trip and hoping to take the flyer that it is a hardcore show. I didn't know. I don't know all the bands. I don't, I'm just taking a chance. Like that flyer looks cool. Sometimes, you know, eight out of 10 times I went and then sometimes it'd just be unique writing. I'd be like, what is this? This is indie. I was like, I don't want this, you know, love indie now, but when I'm at, at that age, no way. It's like when I listen to some guy who's guitar cry, I'm like, get out of here now. <laughs> yeah. So you had to earn that stuff back then. And it was a secret club. Not everybody could find it. And then sometimes it's like the basement show, someone's house. If you're about to walk into someone's house, are they going to let you in? You know, you want to see this band, but that is someone's house. They, you know, they don't have to let you in. It, it was like a secret club. You had to like learn the way of how everybody acts or you get the shit kicked out of you. That, well, I mean, that was, I mean, it was like, it, to me, I called it a hockey game. I called it a hockey game that if you didn't belong, we they policed themselves. And what I used to love, in particular, it doesn't happen as much anymore, but like, you had all these explosive personalities in the scene. And if you didn't, if, this, if like 10 of them there didn't clash, guess what happened? They fought each other. That was it. It was just like they fought, they either never came back again, or all 10 came back to the next show and did it again. Like, I'm not leaving. Well, I'm not leaving. It was, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a ride every time. It was, it was nuts. Yeah, I was. I love what you like analyze, but I was like more so saying a secret club in terms of like being a mainstream person who like knows this guy and that guy. I'm talking like some imaginary being at a level of like Adam Sandler. Like that's like you can do that, but like I'm saying like a lot of people feel like they deserve. It's like when really people don't want to put the work in anymore. Yeah, like they just want one thing, but really it takes like millions of things to get done. And I'm saying when you're in a spot with underground creators, it is a fun club that is really accepting is what I meant. Gotcha. Uh, I, I know what you're saying there too. You have to actually watch though, like, you know, I, I can tell you in film that there's, I've been in Philly, doing the scene here for 10 years and there are groups of filmmakers that have been working together for 10 years and have gotten nowhere. And they've gotten nowhere because every movie is either the same, like it's the same comedy in a row. It's just like, you know, okay, this time you'll play this and play. And they, they're having a blast doing it. They're not taking it seriously. Or maybe they're not paying the money to get it into the film festivals to try to get it out. But like, I call it, Kind of like a sporting team that needs to be blown up. Like you guys clearly have done this for 10 years. You're not getting anywhere. You guys need to go to another team and hopefully get a new spark. You need to work with other people. Yeah. And you have to know as a filmmaker to get out if you're around one of these. I'm not telling you you can't be friends with them, but if they're still spinning their tires after so many years, Think about why they said 10 years. If you die at age 70, that's one seventh of your life. How long, how long do you think you're going to be here? Like you got it. You got it. You got to take a chance. And you what might fall on your chance. Like, like just getting into a new project, getting with new people or what you yeah. were kind of talking with me off camera is that you shouldn't be afraid to cut people off or yeah. an anchor. Is and you know what? Some to? of them people that you cut off, will say, well, you're egotistic and all that and be like, oh, you, you think you're better? Like, no, nah, dude, you're just not listening to me when I say we should try something different. And you're refusing to change. And it's like, I could tell you your next bunch of films in a row. All I have to do is look at your last one because you're not trying to change, yeah. you know? So it's, I, there's not one move I've done film-wise locally that I regret. They're really, they're really not. The people that I had to cut out, the people that I kind of, you know, wave to from a distance, like I want people that are aggressive and really want it. And you've got to be able to put the time in. And I can't tell you how many people don't shut their lives down. Like I still work every single day. I work, I'm up tomorrow at 6 a.m. It's 11.38 right now. Like you got to be able to put the time in. 
Uh, you have to be like after work. You work your real world job. Then you, if you're a filmmaker, then you really go to work. That's when your work day starts. When you're at your regular job, you're just like. I gotta get to my real job. This is a waste of time. Why do I gotta do this? Damn it! Can I get a hit? You know, so I don't have to do this crap anymore. But that's really the way you got. You gotta be hungry. You have to have the whole day lined up, and you just gotta go for it. And there's so many people that are just like they sit on the couch and like, oh, don't worry, this next script, everything's gonna work out great. No, it's not how it is. I can't tell you how many times that like, I would drive two hours to talk to some, an investor that said they wanted to talk to me about putting money into my film. I drive two hours, listen to the investor. Guess what the investor is going to talk about, by the way? They're, they always talk about themselves. They don't really talk to you. It's crazy. They want to talk to you about giving you money, but they want to talk about their family, about how they made money, and all of them. They played baseball once. It's crazy. So I have to listen to that for another two hours, and then I drive back. So there, there's six hours of my life down the toilet where I'm driving back, where it's basically like, I hope I made a good impression. I hardly talked. The guy just talked about himself. Like, you know, like it's crazy, but you have to take a chance. Or you can just sit on your couch. You, you got to hope one. And that's yeah. eventually how a lot of things happen. Uh, they come together. It's just, so like, I mean, it's like bad dates. Eventually you're going to find the one you want to yeah. be with, but you got to go out. You got to listen to someone talk about their ex boyfriend or their dog or whatever the hell <laughs> makes you want to pull that, your hair out of your head. You know, I can't wait for this date to get over with. You get, it's the same way in film guys. You got, you got the same way being in a band. Like, Oh, we got to play this club and you show up and there's 17 people. Like, dude, you got to play and give it your all. I realized there's only 17. You were hoping for hundreds. This is how it is. You got to earn it and hope those 17 people tell other people about your band. And then, you know, 17 comes that 100, you know? You got to earn it. People don't – everybody just wants shit handed to them. It, that's – I'm going to really shit on a lot of people around me right now, but – Shoot shit on them. I'll help you. <laughs> <laughs> but there is this um wave of an American person – I'm not shitting on America right now. I've heard enough shit about that recently. People shitting on... Uh, uh, anyways, um, people that do nothing, collect unemployment, and expect that one... And that are entertainers more so. They sit, collect unemployment, and think that their shit's going to take off and just make shit from their house. Does that make sense? Like, you, there's a wave of that recently... Who of people that just collect, um, you know, they I'm not mad at you because it's from the government, you can get whatever the fuck from the government, but you used to fill f figure out ways to get your hustle on, get your grind on, sell like DVDs it from your like collection. I don't know, but you get what I'm saying. There's like, I think that we're in a lazy period of time, if that makes sense. I think uh, we're down to a Especially with this year too, like everybody, we're, we want stuff. We just complain we want stuff, but we don't want to go get it. We want people to hand it to us, yeah. including government, like government checks and shit. Everybody's just like, I deserve this. There's enough money. Why can't I get this? You know, like I, I think we're on that. I also think between the social media universe where you put a thought out there and you get a hundred people that chime in and say, you're right. I agree with you. I think it goes to everybody's head and they believe, Oh, I have power. And the first person that says, I don't like your idea. Oh, you're out of here. You're blocked and you're a piece of garbage. Like uh, uh, clearly a hundred other people agree with me. It's like you're, you're making your own bubble and that's not the real world. You know, I always tell people it's like, you know, you're trying to get likes and comments out of people you don't know and never going to meet in your, in your life. Yeah. You know, the real world is outside your door. It really is. I'm not saying you it's don't at the meet pond. things online and, and one day you meet. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying out of the hundreds or even the thousands of people you meet online, you're not meeting all those people. That that's the, the, You're not all going to go move to a town someday and, you know, like, oh, yeah, I've been talking to you for 10 years online. That's not how the world works. Yeah, like with the majority of the shit that I post online, like more so social media oriented, I'm really doing it. I really post something specific to fuck with people. Like, not just, just, I do want attention from them to to go watch my shit. 
but I figure that if I post something completely different than the last thing, then they're going to like actually sort of be interested. So like one post will be like me, which is a clip from an interview of someone talking about how he, he's like pours his heart out into his music and stuff like that. And then the next one will be me walking into an anime store and like the footage is just a bunch of loud moans and cause I'm in an anime store and there's like a bunch of like animated pictures of fucking Japanese shit. So I'm really just trying to make something loud for people to be like, Ew, what the fuck? Why is this in my feed? What the fuck? You know what I'm saying? So I'm saying that if you're on social media, don't take it too seriously. It's not a fucking job resume. It's really not. Yeah. You, you get what I'm saying? Yeah, social media has a, like a lot of positives and a, and a whole lot more negatives. Like the positive I always say is like, yo, if I lose your number, man, don't worry about it. I can just hit you up on Facebook. Like uh, I'll, I'll, I'll find you. Like I always know where to find you. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. You know, or like, Hey, wow, whatever happened to such and such, I could search them up online. There they are. Great. Or fast answers. Or someone says something that you don't understand and you feel stupid, you can go Google it and get a fast answer. That's pretty freaking awesome. But there's a lot of people that's making their own universes. And I don't know. So, like, I literally say, like, I hate saying this to my friend. Seven out of ten posts I see in my news feed. I'm like, why on earth? Did, why is that? Why is this a post? Why is one of my male friends taking a selfie in his car? Why do I need to see this? Why did Why did he take a selfie and post it? Oh, there's you and your dog again. I don't care. You know, you know. Here or here's how I rate all the Star Wars films. You know, here's my here's how I rate one to nine. I didn't ask to hear. I don't. I, you think of my day? I'm gonna be thinking like, oh, you like? Oh, my friend John likes Empire number one. At least I know that. Like, I don't care. Like, there's so many people like, don't talk. <laughs> and at, in political, don't even do it. This I don't care. Oh my God. I don't care what it is. It could be the most landslide. You're obviously right. I don't care to hear it. it, it it's just bad news to me. Like, never there's like, the answer is like, before you post, I don't care. So I have to tell most of them, I don't care. <laughs> you know, like, that's why, like, a majority of the shit that I'm looking at is, like, that's why, like, I don't have a personal Instagram. I only really have a Instagram for, like, music shit and YouTube shit because I only really want to see posts about shit that benefits me. And that's the new album that might be coming out from some musician that I'm going to fucking interview to say, oh, you got a new, oh, so is that you got a new project, The Slow Burn? Okay, we'll do an interview three to four weeks after it drops so everybody can listen to it. So I'm, I'm not trying to say, sound like I'm some business savvy uh, snob. I'm saying that, you know, eliminate unnecessary shit from your fucking Without a feed. doubt, yeah. That, look, someone's checking in, they're on vacation. I think... I'm 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 really out there, guys. I just don't understand why people post personal life. I don't like seeing a. a I'm come from old school Italian, okay. I just like guy shit. Guys hide their. Emo I never understood when a guy puts out an emotional post. Like, dude, <laughs> like, are you crying? Did you just tell a thousand of your friends I'm a guy and I'm crying? Like, like, ah, come on, man. Like, I don't know. I just think people really need to chill. I look, I, I'm an extremist about post. When someone's at the gym doing CrossFit, I'm like, why can't you do CrossFit? Why do you have to have a video, someone filming you doing, can't you just do it? You know, like, oh, I'm at the I'm an MMA guy. I'm beating the bag. I'm really filming, be, beating this bag. Like, can't you just beat the bag? Well, or, or someone's bench pressing. Someone has to film it. You just can't sit there and be like, I'm one with my body. I'm going to try to get as much weight as I, up as I possibly could yeah. from the last time I was here. No, Steve, don't film me. Like, yeah, I don't even bring the phone into the gym. I don't because I'm in, that's just, I'm just in workout mode. Yeah. You know, that's just like, you, you can't get better at any of that if you're worried about getting a video done. The only time it makes sense that you'd be filming yourself in the gym is if you're an OnlyFans girl or an Instagram model that's trying to promote their only. Uh, subscription service that's for the it. porn. That's it. That is it. <laughs> you know, I, 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 sometimes I just don't get what what kind of world we 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 came into. I just I just I don't. Get it's it a anymore. weird fucking. Dis I, I know. Yeah, it's a weird dystopian. Weird like fucking some white kid from Ohio that 
was on Disney is fighting Floyd Mayweather? Oh, I didn't hear that one. Logan Paul fought Floyd Mayweather. Did he win? It's weird. There's like no... The match is set up, so there's no official winner. And And people paid to see this and there's not a winner? Yeah. (laughs) Okay. Like they just they just did nothing for like eight rounds basically and like hugged each other and barely fought. It was just like a bunch of the real winners were the f- two fighters because they both got fucking millions of dollars. But like, you know, it is. A, I know this shit said a lot, but it, it's like twenty eighteen shit was fucking simple, man. Twenty nineteen, like I think fall twenty nineteen, early twenty twenty, man. That was like top tier human existence. I don't know. I don't know. That's just me rambling and shit. No, no, no. You're right because it's it's a little more. I mean, not to go political, as I really don't like to talk about. But like, I literally since the world's opening up a little more, like I, I just noticed people I'm catching up with within minutes start talking about politics. Like I support this, this, and this now. So you know, identify me. I, anything. I'm just like, dude, don't. I haven't seen you in a year and a half. Can't we catch up? Like you have to tell me like, like, you know, I have to, I don't care what you stand for. I, we were friends for 20 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I accept you. You don't have to tell me this stuff, you know, stop wearing like, you you like, I'm your friend. Don't wear battle armor to talk to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Like there's, um, it was this weird, peaceful area we were at. We're like, there was the lack of, in February of 2020, I don't think there would be that much complaining. There wasn't, from what I saw, there wasn't a bunch of fucking people complaining as much as, like, beforehand. And, and also, even even though, like, I think the best thing I, best choice I made is, like, April of 2020, when it was, like, the middle of the pandemic, My the best choice I could have made was, like, barely be on my phone. All I did is go outside you know what I'm saying? I woke up at like fucking 3 a.m. and took a bike ride to a fucking canal and like watched the sunrise. And I was in the middle of the highway and there was no cars. Yeah. Biking in the middle. It was a fucking movie, dog. You, you know what? Backing up to what you said about February 2020, that really showed what we're like as a human race. Basically, in the end, when the screws are tightened, we are a species that's out for ourselves. There was no, I'm not trying to open the doors, but like, there was no Black Lives Matter. There was no trans rights. There was no Donald Trump hate. There was no Joe Biden love. All that was gone for about two to three months because we didn't know what this virus was. But what we were doing was running to the store, beating the shit out of each other for toilet paper. It's stocking up our shelves like the world's going to end. When the screws are tightened, everything you stand for goes out the window. And that's exactly what happened. And then a few months later, oh, this virus isn't as bad as we thought. Well, now I'll start wearing my colors again and the game on. That that really, if you really break it down, those first few months was quiet. We were just glued to our TVs. Am I going to live or am I going to die? And I got my food in my ass paper. That's really what it came down to. And then all of a sudden, here came everything else up. You know, like, it was honestly reality, the pretty... pandemic was a, a light beer compared to what we thought it was going to be. You it know? was, I honestly thought that the first three months, man, that was beautiful. Like, honestly, like, there's so much shit that I saw that I never thought that I would ever see. Like, the, from in a negative and positive way, man, it was, it was a, uh, it's fun that I lived through that because it made me realize I got to get off my fucking ass and make some bread and like try and create as much as possible. Like, honestly, that's what I learned from it is like, don't, don't, if, if, if everybody's like making a million different choices for you and stuff like that, you know, learn to make your, you know, outcome independence, shit like that. Like I, I went down a self-help rabbit hole and then I started becoming my own therapist. I don't know what I'm saying is I fucking, I it let me. I think I'll let everybody take some time on themselves if that makes sense. 
It does. Uh, I didn't need this, to be honest, though, when I was, when I was about 19 years old. I was in the hospital for five days hooked to a, to a machine um, because I had a collapsed lung. That, uh, to me, being isolated to that made me realize, like, anything that was happening to me in high school and anything that I thought that was tragic really wasn't. I was like, tragic is knowing I can't stand up and walk away. I'm hooked up to a machine. And this made me think of everything that was that I thought was bad was just silly. There, I, basically, I don't have any problems. My whole life's ahead of me. So I said, when I get off this freaking machine, I'm going out that door. I'm going to see the country. I'm going to go to every concert. You know, I'm going to be in the wrestling business. I'm going to do this. And I did that. So when the pandemic hit, there was no getting myself in check. I have been in check since that. There is one thing I could tell. I told myself, and I could tell all of you is, we went 102 years without a pandemic, regardless of I call this a light beer pandemic, you know, compared to what we thought it could be. But you realize all that downtime we had. You don't know if there's another one or more coming. Don't freaking waste the day. Just don't waste the day. Do everything that's in that mind of yours. Go after it now. That's no matter what it is. That's a Go after it statement. now. That's a beautiful statement. I feel like that's that's how we could wrap this up. That was a great. Do you have anything else you'd like to announce? Or no, something? I think that is a good ending. That's the credit should, pod, should go black great. and the credit should come up. But yeah. Oh, and uh, yeah, check but Lauren Lepre on Instagram and uh, Facebook, and you can uh, Dark Military for free on Amazon and Tubi, Average Superstar Films uh, is my website and average superstar TV on YouTube. And thank you so much for having me on link in the description to everything, almost everything that he mentioned. And, um, majority of what he mentioned, we'll see what, what I remembered, but, but yeah, dude, thanks for coming on, man. This is so, this is, this is a good, it was longer. I like these longer episodes. I don't like the 30 minute episodes. I hate that shit. So, like, this was, like, over, like, an hour and a half, and that's, like, my favorite. Thank you, man. And the best every day, even if I'm up in six hours. I want, I, all I remember tomorrow when I woke up was, like, I did a cool podcast last night. I'm not going to get – I'm not a guy that wakes up and is like, oh, shit, I didn't get enough of sleep. I knew what I was doing. Yeah. And it was all worth it. You know, I can't wait to see the show, so. All right, well, um, that was an episode of Has Discusses. Goodbye.